OKC is is killing, and you got into their situation in today's story, and and I know it's one that you were putting together for a while. Um, you know, take us through that a little bit, and and you know, again, getting right to the key questions. Uh, how much are you believing that these Thunder that you covered so many years ago with KD and Russ that uh, we thought were going to be sitting on picks for years and taking their time that the, they're actually a contender right now? Yeah, well, you know, I've like covered several games over the last few seasons, uh, 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 kind of on the opponent side of the Thunder, right? You know, going to pregame uh, media sessions where Steve Kerr is prepping for the Thunder or Mike Brown, you know, we're down there covering, you know, King's Thunder a couple times this season. They were in the inter, uh, in-season bracket together. Um, and when you would you know, talk to coaches, assistants, you know, in the, in the days leading up, it was always like, you know, like they're just really hard to scout against. They're different. They do all these guard to guard screens that, that are difficult to guard. They, they make you cross match in weird ways. And like, it, it's just not, you don't normally get as much schematic talk heading into an opponent in the regular season. Right. I think we all know that. And I just have felt over the last couple of years, like thunder's doing something offensively that, like smart coaches are are fit, like you know challenged to to scout against going into the game, and uh, I talked to Mark Dagnall, which you know is in, it's in the story, probably your coach of the year front runner right now, uh, just about what they're doing uh, and 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 what makes it so effective, and obviously like the reason they are where they are right now, which I think what is it like twenty three and ten second in the West, uh, is because of the star talent, Shea becoming what he has, which is an MVP candidate, Chet being way ahead of schedule, I think we'd all agree. And then Jalen Williams being like a very capable number three. But it's also just the, you know, the t- the team they've purposely built around them, which I'm if Andrew Sleck wants to hop on, I'm sure we'd love to get his perspective. Yes, he, indeed. Yeah, he's been talking about it for, for a couple of years now. But this very, I would say, different draft and develop strategy that they've had of like just getting guys who can, you know, pass, shoot, dribble, play, make like everyone on the roster, you know, at every position. Uh, and it's, um, you know, they, again, like Andrew has been talking about it for a few years, but it obviously is entering the, the wider consciousness now because they're becoming a contender and becoming a contender quickly. And that has made, you know, teams like Steve Kerr teams, like all, you know, all these other opponents try to figure out like, you know, damn, we're going to have to try to figure out how to guard this on, you know, on a playoff stage. And I just think it's interesting what they're doing. Andrew, before you hop in my friend, um, I would like you to address the Mark Dagnall component here because i i I think i've said it on the pod before i find it so fascinating that the thunder you know routinely have gone about coaching hirings so much differently than the rest of the nba that you know we just had this long robust lakers talk right well guess what when darvin appears to be on the hot seat you what do we talk about oh doc rivers is still uh, you know unemployed uh you know mike boonholzer is out there we go to the same usual suspects all the time and with the Thunder, it's just been different. They they kind of Sam Presti disappears in the mountains for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and and uh, you know, and it goes looking for a guy that nobody's been thinking about, and then comes back, you know, with a Billy Donovan or comes back, you know, with a Mark Dagnall. Do you and, know Dagnall's history though? Quickly, he he got there when I was still there. This was yeah, like, he was you know. with the the blue. I always forget the name of the. Well, he's actually with uh, Billy Donovan at Florida. He that's came right. With You've Billy hit on this before, before. right? Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, it's it, it, so he's been there a while. Andrew can get into it, but I know even I was talking to Chris Paul the other night about the Thunder, and he, you know, Dagnalt was there when Chris Paul was there, and he was like speaking very highly of. He could tell then, like the type of basketball mind he was. But Andrew, I think the the question for you, Andrew, is like, what is your perspective, and how interesting has it been because you are so close to that group to see the rest of the world start waking up a little bit to his capabilities as a coach? Yeah, it's funny because like I I've been using this bit. At summer league the past couple of years it's and i've showed people a picture of him I'm like who is this like nobody knows who he is like he's like the most anonymous nba coach there is and he's probably the most unlikely person to become an nba coach in the league right now you know if you look at like his story of even how he got to florida like he he wasn't su- supposed to be a guy that was like an assistant at florida he certainly shouldn't have been the coach of the oklahoma city blue you know at the time you know he he actually talked about this the other night before the Boston game that part of his success is that people just keep giving him jobs that he's not necessarily ready for, but they just take a chance on him with his potential. And he said, Presti is like the guy that's done that the most for him is that he, he hired him to be the blue coach before he was qualified. He hired him to be an assistant coach for the thunder before he's qualified and certainly brought him up to be the thunder head coach before he was qualified. And he continues to kind of prove him right over and over again. 
did a great job of develop, developing players with the blue. He's done a great job of not only development, but like last night, like Thunder lost to the Hawks, but he drew up this play at the end of the game that got Isaiah Joe this wide open corner three. It was nice. And, I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. And after the game, they said, there, there are like out of bounds plays and you know games or plays at the end of the game that they work on. This is one that he drew up on the fly, and they just all kind of walked away from the huddle. Like, okay, yeah, that's good. Uh, he's a really good basketball coach, and he also isn't afraid to try new things. And I think that's sometimes to the frustration of Thunder fans a little bit. But like, he's he's always willing to like throw in a player here and there. I mean, players know if you're playing for Mark Degnall, you're never out of the rotation fully. Like if you're the 15th man, like you are going to have your chance to play. Like you don't have like a regular nine or 10 man rotation. I think players like that. I think they like that about him is that if they keep working, that they're going to play. Um, they all seem to love him. He's done a great job. Uh, he's he's also like the oldest 37 year old man that I've ever met. Like he likes like old people music and like talks like he's like 60 years old, but he's really like still in his 30s. He's He's, he's a fun guy. Talks about not eating Skittles and eating broccoli. He, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, what? I'll give I'll give a slightly different perspective, Andrew. If that's okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I think some of the Mark Dagnold isn't supposed to be here. Talk is his own humility. Because I've I've yeah. talked about him because I I covered the Thunder too, as has everybody except for Sam on this podcast, and. When I covered the Thunder, he was the head coach of the Blue. And I've talked, and after that, I covered the Wizards. And when I was covering the Wizards, I would talk about him with Bradley Beal because Brad was at Florida when yeah. Mark was, I believe, a, a, a GA. He was a graduate assistant at Florida when mm-hmm. Brad was there. And that's like a low level job. And, and, and Brad would say to me, like, he loves Mark Dignall. And he would say to me, like, that guy is going places. He's amazing. Mm-hmm. His basketball mind is incredible. Mm-hmm. And he just respects him so much for his basketball mind. So I think from a personality standpoint, you know, Mark Dignall is kind of small time in a way. I mean, when I was covering the Thunder, their, their head, uh, or not even their head, their, one of their media relations people would ask me and Brett Dawson, who was at the Oklahoma at the time, to specifically come and cover G League games on like Friday nights, not because they wanted us to write anything, but because Mark wanted practice doing post game interviews. So mm. we would come and we would cover it and then we would interview him after the game and just kind of not really do as much with the interviews just to help him out with the interviews. He's like very dedicated and thinks about. Everything. Which, and thinks by about the way, he, he's a he's a he's a really uh, informative interviewee. Also, right? You mm-hmm. know, you go across the league. We all, you know, go into these various coaching uh, pregame sessions, postgame sessions. Again, like I said, I talked to him probably for 15 minutes for this story. Uh, he's like he'll detail stuff, and not in a way that I think the Thunder doesn't want him to. Right? I mean, there's obviously uh, aspects of just like the Thunder operation that they don't necessarily want to. To, to have out there but i just like he's he's smart but he's also like practiced i think within that and i, I come away from every pre-game or post-game session from mark like learning something ab- about the thunder and you can't say that about a lot of coaches and in some ways that's a strategy about a lot of coaches but and fred Katz helped them get there i think that's what we're learning <laughs> <laughs> there's there's something there's something about the g league like these guys who become head coaches after they were head coaches in the g league there's something about the G League that turns all of those guys. I don't know. Maybe this is a story idea for someone. Maybe me. Uh, there's something about the G League that turns head coaches into just like more experimental coaches. Hmm. You look at all the guys who were G League coaches, Nick and Nurse. you look at like Nick Nurse, yeah. who's yeah. just whipping out weird defenses to try to combat things. And then you look at like, Darko Ryakovich, who is who is after him in Toronto, and is like, we're gonna come in, we're gonna play this 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 full on ball movement stuff. Uh, there's something. I mean, our producer Dave DeFore is writing in the chat right now and knows about coaching. And says you have to experiment because the rosters are weird and games don't really matter as much, and that's true. And the rosters are constantly changing as well. But you look at these guys who were head coaches in the G League, and like you mentioned, Andrew, I was at that Thunder Timberwolves game a couple of weeks ago, and all of a sudden. Michich is in the game 
He hasn't played yeah. since 1976. He looks <laughs> like he just smoked seven cigarettes before he came off the bench. And all of a sudden, he's in the game. And why? It's just like to get him ready because you don't know if you're going to have a couple of guys. Just just keep him ready. There yep. aren't a lot of coaches who who go through rotations, go through strategies like that. I love that point, Fred. And and the fun part is that before you know it, if you're successful, you're Nick Nurse and you're telling Joel Embiid, hey, big fella, be patient with me because I'm going to throw stuff against the wall. And that was part of their conversation in training camp. Um, so that dynamic is is definitely entertaining. Apologies, gents, for being – I'm going to – I keep being the guy who's going to bring it back to to center with the, the stuff I think the listeners want to know about. Whoever wants to weigh in, because you're all, like you said, experts on the Thunder um, – they have a damn good team already. The you know they're up there with the Timberwolves team that has actually come back to the pack a little bit. No pun intended. These past couple of games, um, and they also, uh, as we all know, have a ton of assets. Do you anticipate them letting this thing grow organically uh, and, and waiting until the summertime to look at other options? Do you think uh, maybe something around the edges happens here, trade deadline wise? What do we think the Thunder do? I think Andrew would have more like on the ground feel for if they will or won't just from, you know, I think we all know who, who and how they run. Mm -hmm. Um, And also we all understand like the league, like they're fun right now. They're 23 and 10, but it's 33 games into the season. Uh, Look at the age of their starting lineups. Look at the experience. I mean, didn't Chet had a quote the other day, basically saying we ain't done shit yet. Mm -hmm. Um, Like the, I would assume Sam Presti wants to see this core go through a playoff. You know, you learn a lot more about a true ability to contend in the playoffs. We just have not seen this team in the playoffs uh, with, with, you know, veteran teams scouting on an everyday basis against them and, and just the grind and, and the chess match that is April, May and June. So uh, my guess, knowing how they operate would be a, an extremely patient approach, even though obviously they have all the ammo uh, if they want to nibble around the edges. But Andrew, uh, you know, you might, have a better feel for that yeah they don't want to disrupt anything that's happening now like pe- people want to throw larry market in all the time and not that the jazz are in any hurry to trade him but if he was out there i would expect the thunder would not be the team to be interested because he'd be taking away shots from guys like chet and j-dub i don't think that's what they want to do and so i think they'll remain patient i think they could they could get in there for i think they need probably like one or two vets off the bench because you're going to get to the playoffs and like maybe some of these young guys aren't ready to play playoff minutes. And so I think that you could maybe get yourself like a, like a Royce O'Neal or somebody like that to come in. That's can just play 10 or 15 minutes. Andrew, don't you think though that this season, Sam Presley wants to find out what young guys aren't ready. You know what I mean? It's almost like go fail in the playoffs potentially. So we could. know that you're not ready. You You could, you also look at the West and think there's an opportunity. Yes, here. that is that's you know? the, yeah for sure. You know, and so to me, I think you could probably acquire somebody that's not going to demand a ton of minutes, but is still more ready to play in the playoffs. That if Casey Wallace did blow up and he's just like amazing as a playoff guy, then you you don't worry about like Royce O'Neal's expiring contract. Like he's he'll be fine. You know, he can just sail off elsewhere but i believe I, Derek fisher and karan butler are free agents currently yeah <laughs> no, anybody Ke- kendrick randy perkins foy. can Ran- randy, foy. Can there too. randy yeah. foy yeah i mean i i i think there's definitely i don't expect them to acquire like multiple players which they could easily do because they have all these picks like they could they could form a playoff rotation very easily with the assets that they have now they're not going to do that. They're going to let some of these guys play. But I still think maybe like one more big wing. And also, I'll say this. People keep saying like, oh, they need to go get a big, like a Jared Allen or somebody like this. They're not going to acquire anybody that doesn't play the style. Of Shoot, the pass, thunder. dribble, screen, do everything, right? Yes. That's what it is. Like Nick Claxon's another guy I keep hearing. Like, they're not going to acquire somebody like that. They're, they want somebody that can fit right away with what they do. They're not going to change their approach with you know with some kind of like late season acquisition like they need to be able to play like the thunder play and so to me it's not necessarily true that they're going to go get like some big or somebody and and if they do it needs to be somebody that can pass and somebody that can shoot it a little bit certainly at the five right that's like a key part of what they do is like their, their five man needs to be able to hit threes that's why i circle kelly olenic he's expiring contract he's in utah he we don't know if he's going to stick around afterwards and if you're utah like you you could get you know 
three seconds or whatever it would take, you know, and they get assets, the Thunder get a player that can play for them right away that plays exactly the way they do. And he's a big body that you can throw in there. You know, if you're playing against Minnesota or you're playing against Denver and he can, yeah, he could play with Chet, you know, it's a guy like that, that I think makes sense. Yeah. It's and like, I, I'm bringing I, bigs don't, I also think he, he's not do a big contract. And right. I think that's one of yeah. the other things people need to remember. Like, all these guys are going to get monster deals when they're up yep. for monster deals. And we know, that, you know, how forward thinking the Thunder can be with like where their salary caps going. So like, yeah, that's, I think matters here. 